work to do. He doesn't have to create the material universe or maintain uh, all the living entities or adjust the different uh, situations of the yugas. That's up to Vishnu. So when Krishna performs those activities in his appearance, that means he's acting in the mood of Vishnu or Narayan. Therefore, that incarnation is within him and he can manifest that uh, activity or that function when it's appropriate in his pastimes. But actually Krishna is always thinking of Vrindavan, wanting to go back to Vrindavan, uh, wanting to associate with his devotees in Vrindavan because they're the most advanced devotees. They give Krishna the most pleasure. Krishna doesn't really enjoy um, fighting battles in, uh, uh, in association with the Yadu dynasty. That's not why he came to this planet. He came here to exhibit his Vrindavan pastimes and to reclaim those devotees who were ready to go back to the spiritual world with him. Now, where's the scriptural proof? In the uh, Ramayana, there's a narration that when Lord Rama was exiled in the forest with Lakshman and Sita, there was a whole group of sages who had been worshiping him for many, many thousands of years. Back in those days, people lived a lot longer than they do now. So then when Lord Rama appeared at their hermitage, they prayed to him, please let us worship you as your conjugal lovers. And Lord Rama answered, well, I accept your prayer, but I can't accept you in this form, in this incarnation, because in this incarnation as Lord Rama, I only have one wife. But in my next appearance on this planet as Lord Krishna, then I will accept you. So when Lord Krishna appeared on this planet 5,000 years ago, he appeared with his eternal associates from the spiritual world. But he also associated with many souls who were just getting liberation from this material world. It was their, uh, their opportunity to go back to Godhead. So the gopis who were eternal associates are given in uh, various Vedic literatures. There's 108 of them. And then the other gopis, thousands and thousands of them, were uh, conditioned souls who were accepting liberation and joining Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan. And Krishna came to this universe to pick them up, take them back home with him. This is the understanding given by Srila Prabhupada in Krishna book. So we should understand Krishna's pastimes are eternal. They're always going on at some place or other. Hmm? If, if Krishna is not in the spiritual world, then he's appearing in some material universe in order to display his pastimes to the conditioned souls. And these pastimes go on. Um, Prabhupada explained it's like a movie. A movie can be shown in one theater and then it can be shown in another theater and then it can be shown in other theaters, either at the same time or at other times. Uh, but the movie is, uh, is always playing somewhere, 24 hours a day as the world turns. In some country, in some time zone, the movie is playing. So Krishna's pastimes are like that. Krishna's pastimes are always manifest somewhere. Somewhere right now, Krishna is killing Putana. Huh? Somewhere he's dancing with the gopis. Somewhere he's taking the cows out to the forest. Somewhere he's doing all the pastimes described in Srimad Bhagavatam. So those pastimes are eternal. They're ever existing. Uh, they're always manifest somewhere. If not in the spiritual world, then in the material world. These are Krishna's Nitya Lila, eternal pastimes. And we can join those pastimes too. How do we do that? Well, it starts by chanting Krishna's holy name, of course. But more than that, we have to meditate on Krishna's form. Bhishma is saying here, um, the devotee should glorify him. Bhaktya uh, purusham avyayam. We should glorify the Supreme Person. And... Uh, Dhyayan stuvan namasyangscha. 
Namasya, we should always give obeisances to him. And meditate on his form, Dhyayan Stuvan. Meditate on his transcendental form. And Yajamanas Tangevacha. We should perform these activities constantly. These activities of devotion should be unbroken. And then our spiritual consciousness will always be there. Not that we uh, live like an ordinary person and then, you know, one hour a day, two hours a day, uh, we invest in some transcendental service. No, that, that won't do it. That won't give us enough impressions of transcendental consciousness to really change our consciousness so that we can go to the spiritual world. No, we have to find a way to think of Krishna 24 hours a day. That is the standard. That is the actual goal. So when we're working, if we offer the results of our work to Krishna or to Krishna's service or to Krishna's servants, then that time that we spend working is not wasted because the result of that work is going to be offered to Krishna with love and devotion as devotional service. Similarly, if we're performing other duties, somehow or other, we should link those with Krishna's service. And that's bhakti yoga. It's not what you do, it's why you do it. So let's say if a person is very attached to music, to use my own example, uh, he can offer his music to the service of the Lord, use all of his creativity, all of his skill, all of his talents, and uh, by engaging them in the service of the Lord, they all become purified and transcendental. You see? This is the principle of karma yoga. To take our karma, whatever that karma is, whatever we're born with, whatever hand we're dealt by the laws of nature, laws of cause and effect, as a result of our previous activities, and take that karma and somehow link it with Krishna. Karma yoga. Yoga means linking. Yukta is the root of, of uh, the word yoga. And yukta is used in the sense of connecting things like a horse and a cart. So if we connect our karma with Krishna, it becomes karma yoga. Otherwise, it's just plain karma. And it leads to rebirth in this material world. So karma yoga is important. Also, buddhi yoga is important. Buddha means intelligence. So when we uh, engage our intelligence in understanding Krishna's words or words about Krishna, then this is Buddha, buddhi yoga. Buddhi means uh, discrimination, actually. We should know the difference between matter and spirit. That distinction is given in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, huh? that the sages have studied the nature of reality, and they've determined that of the temporary, there is no existence, and of the existent, there is no cessation. In other words, things that really exist are eternal things. Huh? Things that are transient and temporary you can't say they really exist because they only exist for a very short time. Even if this body, for example, lives to a full lifespan of 100 years, that's only 100 years out of how many thousands and millions and billions of years in the past and how many thousands and millions of billions of years in the future. Out of that, there's this little slice of time, 100 years, and this body temporarily exists. So most of the time, it doesn't exist. Practically speaking, you could say it doesn't really exist because it's just a flash. It's just flickering, as Srila Prabhupada used to say. Uh, it's flickering. The material body, the material enjoyment, material activities are all flickering. Even things like yoga and religion have a beginning and an end. When the yogis attain their goal of self-realization or mystic powers or whatever, then they give up their yoga practice. But the devotees 
are chanting the holy name in this world, and even after liberation, they're chanting the holy name in the spiritual world. In this world, they're serving Krishna, offering food and other things, and in the spiritual world, they're doing the same activities. So the activities of bhakti yoga are eternal. They have no beginning and no end. This is sanatana dharma, eternal spiritual activities. So we should engage in these eternal activities as much as possible. And we should generate as many impressions of eternal quality, spiritual quality, as we can. That's why we chant again and again and again. Huh? We like to chant. Well, that's one thing. But the other thing is we want to create as many impressions to counteract the influence of the impressions of material quality. And that's how we actually change our consciousness. The impressions accumulate in the mind. 